Ah! Greetings brethren, Cloaking Donkey here, bringing you the first in a series of guides on classic Dark Age of Camelot. In this first guide we're going to talk about the very basics of Dark Age of Camelot. If you haven't played Dark Age of Camelot before, there are certainly going to be a bunch of things that will seem incredibly outlandish to you because they have gone very much out of style in more contemporary MMORPGs. But even if you're a veteran of many years, you might still find something that you didn't know, because a lot of the information about Dark Age of Camelot is buried in the deep, deep webs. Dark Age of Camelot is very much a class-based MMORPG. The classes play a vital role in this game, much, much more than they do in a lot of more modern games, where classes have kind of been replaced by roles, as in the Trinity. So, take World of Warcraft, for example. It really doesn't matter if you're a hunter or a rogue or a mage, because all three of these classes are DPS, and the only difference is that one of them is a melee DPS class. Ooh, and even that really doesn't change change all that much. This is not the case in Dark Age of Camelot. Dark Age of Camelot has several classes that are unique in what they bring to the group because the game is not focused around tank, heal and DPS and instead is focused around the idea of group roles. A general rule is the more of these roles you have in your group, the better your group will perform. Obviously there's some overlap because you can build your group either toward melee or toward more spell heavy or toward a bomber loadout and then you just might not need certain types of class roles. But in general the more utility pieces you have for your group the better your group is going to perform. So let's go quickly over the group roles. Main healer is not too outlandish of a concept, it's a strong healer character just like a healer would be in contemporary MMOs. However, the difference is that only one of these main healers exists per faction. So if you want a really strong healer for your group, you have to go for this one class. The main buff class is something that has gone entirely out of style in recent years. Back in the olden days, a lot of MMORPGs would pool all of the group buffs on one class, which would then vindicate this class for group play, but they wouldn't really necessarily get much else to make them a good addition. Main buffers in Dark Age of Camelot provide various stat buffs that stack with the baseline buffs that pretty much every support class already has, further enhancing the performance of group members, and generally the main buffer role is also mixed with something else. For example, the main healer role, because two of the main buffers are the Cleric in Albion and the Druid in Hibernia. Main tank is also something you are familiar with, however the main tank role specifically only really refers to the defensive part of tanking. Practically any class that can specialize in some kind of melee weapon gets taunt abilities, so all of them can keep aggro if they want to, but only the main tank classes really have the survivability to keep that up for any amount of time. It is however good to know that pretty much anyone that wields a weapon and uses weapon styles can taunt in a pinch. Melee damage dealers are pretty damn straightforward in Dark Age of Camelot and they really don't provide that much else apart from just doing absurd melee damage. Usually the straight up damage dealers also come with dual wield and the benefit of this is that they then double tap on any melee support that might be provided. And if they get endurance regeneration then they can pretty much keep their damage going forever unlike casas who will eventually run out of power. And this is what makes melee damage dealers so enticing. And this is kind of the conundrum with melee damage dealers in Dark Age of Camelot. By themselves, they are certainly weaker than single target casters or bomb casters. But at the same time, they benefit much, much more from buffs and support, endurance regeneration and all of these other things that just keep piling up to make them stronger. Single target casters have high single target and sometimes also ranged target AoE abilities. Their damage output is pretty predictable and straightforward and they can stay pretty safe from behind the lines. However, their damage output is limited by their power bar and while you can have mana batteries to improve the power regeneration of your group, they will never really be able with the sustain of a melee damage dealer. But over the shorter times that they do put out damage, they put out more DPS in general than melee damage dealers do. Bomb casters are very, very specialized casters. Usually they only really bring one spell that they use and that is the ultra high damage point blank AOE spells. These spells do more damage the closer you are to the target that you are damaging with the spell. So you want to basically stand right inside the monster and then you'll do a million trillion damage by nuking them. The problem with this is of course that if you're right next to the monster, if you get aggro and they punch you, that's it for you with casting and well if the monster is strong enough you might just die. 
So bomb casters really tend to need main tanks to keep them alive. The debuffer role is a little bit more important for realm versus realm fighting than it is for PvE or leveling. A lot of the really good debuffs just don't affect monsters in the same way, because some of the strongest debuffs in Dark Age of Camelot are Disease and Nearsight. Disease reduces the healing the target takes from any sources by 50%, and Nearsight reduces the enemy's casting distance by a certain percentage at higher levels up to 60%. Generally, the strong debuffs are really there to screw over enemy healers. And healers are generally not something you face in PvE combat. But as soon as you venture out into RVR, and Dark Age of Camelot is an RVR game, those debuffs start becoming very, very powerful indeed. Crowd Controller is certainly one of the most powerful and arguably most important roles you can have in your group. A lot of monsters when pulled will bring friends, obviously making them much harder to deal with. Having a crowd controller who can just send two or three of them to sleep while you deal with one of them, and then keep them crowd controlled while you pick them off one by one, obviously makes everybody's job so much easier. Mana batteries have a song, aura or buff that will regenerate their and their group's power over time. This is an effect that works both in and out of combat and it is very important. Your healers will love you for having a mana battery with you. However, if you're playing a damage casting group, you will still have mana breaks because the mana regeneration songs and buffs simply cannot keep up with the consumption of damage casters. Endurance regeneration classes, the other side of this coin, have a song or or buff to regenerate their own and their group's endurance. This endurance regeneration is a little bit different. Endurance usually does not regenerate when you are running, and the endurance regeneration buff allows you to regenerate it even while running. That makes endurance regeneration very powerful and very very important for melee groups indeed. On top of that, just like with the main healer, endurance regeneration only exists on one class per realm. Bubble or PBT, which means Pulsing Blade Turn, is an effect placed on your group members by the Bubbler, who will then negate the next melee attack those group members take. If the Bubbler already has their Pulsing Blade Turn, then this is an aura that affects the entire group, so every time one of your group members receives any melee hit, it will be negated, and the effect refreshes every 10 seconds, 8 seconds or 6 seconds, depending on the level of the Bubbler and how many points he has invested into the specialization line where the bubble can be found. As you can probably imagine, this can stack up really quickly and you can negate a lot of melee hits, which is a lot of damage saved and makes your healer's job so much easier. The bubble is also something that only exists once per realm. Melee supporter is a little bit more of a loose category as there are several effects that really make melee so much stronger. For example, the healer in Midgard has a buff called Celerity that is a huge increase in melee attack speed. Sadly, this buff only exists on Midgard, but on all realms you also have damage add buffs, which add additional damage to every attack you make. And this is why characters using two weapons have a little bit of an edge when it comes to this, because they double dip on this damage add. And then lastly we have the speed class, also something that only exists once per realm. It is a song class that provides a speed increase among all kinds of other useful effects. All of the speed classes generally are some type of hybrid or support class. The first big difference you might encounter if you choose to play a casting class is the interruption system. In World of Warcraft and all the other MMORPGs that so desperately wanted to be like it in the last 10 years, when you get hit by a monster while casting a spell, your casting bar is just reset a little bit and you keep casting and it really just takes longer for you to get your spell out. This is not the case in Dark Age of Camelot. If you get hit while you are casting, there is a very, very high chance that your cast will be entirely interrupted and that it will be blocked from casting any spells for one, two to three seconds, depending on the spell you were casting, you, the melee hit you received, it was a critical, all these sorts of things. The further you are towards completing your spell cast, the higher your chance for you to resist any interrupts. This of course means that casting speed is incredibly important and we'll get to that in the other guides where we'll talk about stats and all these sort of things. Now let's quickly go over regeneration, because regeneration for all your various pools certainly has slightly different rules than you might expect. Health regenerates about 10 times faster when you are outside of combat, and it also regenerates about twice as fast if you sit down. 
The same goes for Endurance and Power, they also both regenerate at about twice the rate if you sit your character down. So sitting down between fights is actually quite important. Power is the yellow bar on your character and it's what you use for all types of magic. Power regenerates both in and outside of combat, obviously the regeneration is a little bit reduced when you're in combat, but there's one more quirk to power regeneration on pure spellcaster classes. And these are only the classes that are limited to cloth armor, that use a staff as their weapon, so I'm not talking about healers. These full caster classes have reduced power regeneration when they are below 50% of their power pool. So with these classes you should always try to keep your power above 50% because you will simply regenerate more power. Treat the lower half of your power pool as a emergency reserve that you only tap into when the group is otherwise going to wipe. Endurance does not regenerate while you are in combat and it also doesn't regenerate while you are running. So even when you're running and you're not in combat, your endurance will not regenerate. Only when you stand still or sit down will it then start to regenerate. This is what makes the endurance regeneration buff just a little bit more important than the power regeneration buff. Because without it, your group's melee classes will use up all their endurance and then they are stuck on zero endurance until you have a literal stop of the action and have them sit down and wait. Right now to the color con system. That is also something that it confuses a lot of new players because from more modern games that all rely very heavily on the systems of World of Warcraft, when a monster's name is yellow it generally means that it's neutral and when it's red it means it's aggressive. But here the monster name has nothing to do with its attitude towards you. It has simply to do with the level that it has in relation to your own level. Yellow monsters are pretty much exactly your level and they are just as strong as you are. They will give really good experience when you kill them solo, but not every class in the game is able to kill yellow mobs by themselves. For example, most support classes really struggle against yellows, and out of the main healers really only the cleric can deal with yellow monsters by themselves. Blue monsters are slightly below your level and they are also slightly weaker than you are, but the experience you gain for them is still pretty decent. And this is pretty much what you will kill for experience if you are by yourself most of the time, if you cannot kill yellows reliably. Pretty much every class in the game can solo blue monsters. Green monsters are quite a bit under your level and they are very weak and you receive hit and damage bonuses against them. The trade-off for that is that the experience you gain from them is absolutely minimal and it takes a lot of green monsters to level up. As soon as a monster's name is grey, that means it is so far below your level that you won't get any experience or items for killing it, but you also gain massive hit and damage bonuses against them, and if they are aggressive monsters, they will no longer attack you by themselves. So if you leave them alone, they will leave you alone. Oranges are a little bit over your level and you get hit and damage penalties when attacking orange monsters by yourself. They're a challenge for some classes and practically impossible for most classes to kill when you're on your own. There's only a very small number of classes that can actually kill red monsters by themselves. However, there's not much point to it because the highest level of orange that you can kill is where you will gain maximum experience if you are by yourself. So killing red monsters by yourself is really just you bragging to the world. Red monsters is what you're supposed to kill when you're playing with a small group of other characters. Purple monsters are death and destruction. They come to burn your villages and pillage your fields. You get absolutely crazy hit and damage penalties against purple monsters and attempting them by yourself is practically suicide for every but one class. Purples are simply there to be killed in groups and even smaller groups might be having problems with purples and might have to downgrade to reds. Of course, also remember that purple is very much open-ended, so if you are level 10, everything from about level 16 or 17 to level 50 or 75 will be purple to you, and there's no indication of what level they actually are. So be very careful when attacking purples, make sure there are at least some red monsters around that give you an indication that this is even a leveling area for you. Once again, please remember that the color has nothing to do with the monster's attitude. If you want to see the monster's attitude toward you, you will have to click on it and then read in the combat log whether the monster is neutral, friendly or aggressive toward you. If it's aggressive, it will attack if you come too close. Also remember that these colors apply to NPCs as well and to items. And that is our next point. 
A weapon or a weapon, piece of armor or piece of jewelry will have its name displayed in a color. This color does not signify quality or rarity, but it signifies the item's level in relation to you, just like with monsters. In fact, there really are no quality or rarity levels in this game, so there is no uncommon or rare or epic. All magical items are just that, magical. If it is a piece of armor, you can calculate the level of the item by the armor factor. For cloth armor, the armor factor will be level times one, and for all other types of armor, it's level times two. DPS on a weapon is hopefully pretty self-explanatory, and the weapon speed refers to the basic swing time of the weapon in seconds. So if it's a 4.2 speed weapon, your character will swing every 4.2 seconds before you add anything such as quickness or haste multipliers, etc, etc. And then every item also has four other stats. Condition directly affects an item's properties. So if the condition of your sword, for example, is 80%, then your sword will only have 80% of its normal hit chance and 80% of its normal damage. Same of course with armor, a condition of 90% means you only get 90% of the armor factor. The condition of an item decreases with use over time. And it goes back up to 100% every time you repair it at a NPC smith or a player smith. And it stops decreasing at 70%, but when it reaches 70%, the item is considered severely damaged and repairing the item will be far more expensive in both money and durability lost. Durability on every item starts at 100% and it goes down every time you repair the item. This is an exponential decrease, so the lower the condition of the item at the time of repairing, the more durability will be lost. So it is a good idea to repair your items as often as possible and try not to let them fall under 90%. Personally, I always repair my items at 95% at the very latest or just before I venture out on an XP farming group. When durability reaches 0% and condition drops to 70%, the item is considered broken, can no longer be repaired and pretty much is garbage at that point. So yes, there is item decay and items will eventually be practically destroyed. This is the trade-off for the game not having any bind on equip, bind on pickup systems whatsoever. Any item you find, you can wear for as long as you want and then still sell to other people. There are no soul binding mechanics in classic Dark Age of Camelot, apart from very fringe cases such as various class rewards you might obtain. And so because of that, there needs to be mechanics to stop the crazy inflation over time. The quality of an item is assigned to it upon its creation. It doesn't change. So when an item drops for you, the quality is generated at that time and will never ever be altered. The quality also directly affects the item's properties. So for example, a 85% sword only does 85% of its damage. This obviously makes the problem with condition a lot worse because both of these stack with each other. Vendor bought items are always at 85% quality and most magical items that drop in the world are at 89% quality. The only reliable source for 100% quality items is from crafters and from epic quests. Which means eventually at level 50 to get yourself some really good gear you will want to visit a crafter. The bonus percentage is something that goes up with levels. So when you start out, the basic bonus is 5% and it goes up all the way to 35% at level 50. On a piece of armor, the bonus reduces your chance of being hit on that piece of armor's slot. So if it's the chest, then every time somebody strikes you and the chest is chosen as the location, then they have a reduced chance of hitting you there. On a weapon, bonus will increase your chance of hitting. So bonus is actually pretty important. All right, and then lastly, let's talk about some quirks of the attribute and stat system as pertaining to equipment. All stat and attribute gains from equipment are absolutely hard capped and this is based on your level. So for example, your standard attributes such as strength and constitution have a hard cap of 1.5 per character level on your gear. This cap is just for gear, there are separate caps for buff caps and there's an overall soft cap for most stats, but we're not gonna worry about those just yet because it really doesn't matter that much when you're just starting the game. But the hard caps for stats on gear are important. From your items, however much strength you equip, you will only ever get plus 75 and everything above 75 is utterly discarded 
and ignored by the game, which really just means you don't want to stack as much strength and constitution as possible on a tank, but instead you want to try to get as many of these stats and attributes to the cap as you can. And this is what's called templating. So instead of being, say, a warrior and just taking every item that has strength, constitution and hit points, instead you try to get several items that fit together to get you 75 strength, 75 constitution, 200 hit points, 75 dexterity, 75 quickness and 26 in all of the resistances, as well as plus 11 to shield and whatever your weapon is. Building templates is a little bit of a game within a game situation and some people absolutely love it. If you love theory crafting or if you're just a fan of crafting in general and you like to dive really deep into this stuff, you're probably going to love this system because it actually has some kinks and quirks to it where you can choose to invest a little bit less money and then get a slightly weaker build or you can get a much stronger template but that costs so much more money. There's actually quite a lot of possibilities with template building, especially because jewelry on your character you cannot make with a crafter. So the jewelry has to actually come from world drops and then you kind of arrange your armor and your weapons around that. Some people also find building templates incredibly frustrating and annoying, but the great thing about Dark Age of Camelot is of course its community. You will always be able to find someone who's willing to make a template for you Probably for a few plat, most people don't do it for free, but if you have somebody in your guild who loves making templates, maybe they'll even do it for free if they like you a lot. But honestly, templates aren't something you need to worry about right now, because right now you still haven't even begun to create your character. After listening to this boring PowerPoint presentation, however, you are now ready to actually create your character. And so make sure to check the description of this video as well as the cards in the top right for all of the beginner guides and the leveling guides for the various factions. If you enjoyed this video and if this guide was helpful to you, then please consider giving the video a like. Also consider subscribing because I do all sorts of fancy content for all sorts of MMOs out there. Beyond that, I also stream various MMOs and tomfoolery on my Twitch channel of twitch.tv slash cloakingdonkey. So come by and check that out as well. But until then, I've been the Cloaking Donkey and I'll see you in another video. 